Thanks for the nice introduction, Sarah. And hi, everyone. It's nice to be here today. And I am going to briefly talk about native seeds and the Southwest Seed Partnership and why nurseries and farms are so important to our work. I'm just going to touch on this briefly before we hear from our panelists. And so native seed is used in a variety of ways and in different scales across the Southwest. They're used in reseeding from wildfire, in rangeland restoration, erosion control, and revegetation after oil and gas development, among many other uses. And so each year, a huge amount of seed is used across our region, but historically and, and currently, um, the seed that is available commercially is often not appropriate for the arid Southwest. And many people in the restoration community here have identified this lack of locally sourced seed as a barrier to successful restoration. And so like Sarah mentioned in the introduction, to address this need, the Southwest Seed Partnership began in 2015 with the goal of increasing that availability of locally appropriate, or excuse me, of ecologically appropriate seed for New Mexico and Arizona. And what we mean by ecologically appropriate is seed that is locally sourced and genetically diverse. And so it's more likely to be adapted to our arid ecosystems, and then it's more likely to succeed when it's used in restoration projects. So the partnership is working collaboratively to increase the supply of this type of seed so that restoration practitioners have a diversity of species and local sources to choose from when they need seed for their projects. So the partnership works with local nurseries and farmers in order to make this happen. We hire seed collection crews to sustainably collect seed from the wild, from plants that have those local adaptations to our harsh environments. And then we grow that source seed in nurseries and in agricultural fields in order to drastically increase the amount that becomes available. And so we rely on nurseries and farmers like our panelists here today to reach our goal of widespread native seed availability. And we're excited to share their work today. I will turn it over to you, Melanie. Great, thank you, Maria. And thank you so much for the introduction, Sarah, and the invitation to be here tonight. Um, yeah, so this is going to be fun. Um, we're doing something new here. We have a panel um, discussing three different native plant capacity building projects um, from, from funds in 2019 from the Native Plant Society. And, um, and these projects are um, a high school nursery project, a native seed farmer, um, capacity building project and our project at our state at a state New Mexico State Penitentiary. Um, and so here's our here are our panelists and um, we're going to introduce each one one at a time and they will each talk about their projects related to these capacity building funds. And at the end of the presentation, um, we will have time at the end for you to ask um, questions. And um, you can ask questions of one individual, you know, if you can put their name in um, the chat, or you can ask questions of the entire group. And um, so feel free to um, put your questions in the chat um, down at the bottom, right next to the, it's the button right next to the participants. And we also invite you to, um, uh, if you're more, if you, you prefer to ask questions in person, we invite you to raise your hand. And so if you go to the button on the far right at the bottom, uh, the little smiley face with the plus sign on his head, um, there's a raise hand bar at the bottom when you click on that. Um, just click that and then we'll know to call on you. Um, so with that, um, we can go to the next slide. So our first panelist is Jason Roback. And I have actually known Jason for more than probably close to 30 years. Um, we were both at UNM together as undergraduates in the biology department. Um, and Jason went on to become a biology and science teacher um, at Sandia High School. And he's been there for 
many years. And just five years ago, uh, coincidentally, we reconnected at an Albuquerque chapter Native Plant Society meeting. And ever since we've been working together on a wide variety of projects, um, both conservation and education projects, including this last summer um, where we harvested edible invasive species in New Mexico, and then we served them up at a cook-off event, which was a lot of fun. It's been great working with Jason. Uh, he's got a great passion for the natural world and his passion for uh, both that and education is truly contagious. Next slide, please. And I don't know how many of you know that um, Jason is also very resourceful. He got funding to purchase and construct a state-of-the-art greenhouse at, uh, that he had installed on the high school campus, as well as a life-size outdoor wetland classroom. And of course, he plants native plants here. And with that, I will turn it over to Jason. Hello. Um, I know some of you. I've been in the this chapter for I don't know how long, about 10 years on and off, I believe. Um, so yeah, thank you. That was a great introduction, uh, Melanie. Yeah, we, I said, she said we met again. That was, she was given a, a presentation and I kept looking at her and I was like, I think I know you from somewhere. So we figured it out. It was, we had a field trip class to Puerto Penasco, Mexico back in, oh God, 92 or something like that. Um, anyway, so um, I, I actually gave a presentation about my pond to you guys five years ago, I wanna say. So I don't wanna to talk too much about it, but I need, probably should give you a little bit of information. So um, we, uh, so again, Sandy High School in, in Albuquerque, uh, very, 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 very fortunate that we've had this um, outdoor environmental classroom or the pond as kids mostly call it. And um, we had one in our old building. We just got a new science building uh, six years ago and, um, they got rid of the old one, and um, but the compensation prize was they built one about three times as big, and um, they uh, very graciously allowed me to have a little bit of say in, in its design, a little bit of say, but but some in its design, and um, but the building and the pond were kind of designed to go together. It's 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 I it's amazing. <laughs> I don't know. I literally can't think of a better situation as a science teacher than um, at Sandia. Um, especially for the biology teachers, we have doors. Each one of us has an individual door that goes right out to this classroom. It's, it's, it's wonderful. Um, anyway, um, so um, I've become the kind of uh, de facto uh, caretaker, I suppose, of this area. And so my mission with our outdoor classroom is to, uh, as much as we can, you know, design curriculum and get students out there as much as possible. Um, so again, you know, a lot of these concepts we cover in biology, instead of them being this dry, maybe boring thing that they may not believe applies to them or is important, um, get them out there and see it for real. You know, interestingly, uh, yesterday we were talking about evolution and talking about sexual selection, and the whole time I had my door open to the pond and we could hear a uh, redwood blackbird male calling, and it was this perfect example. Of, like, why is he calling? And we talked about mate choice and territory. So I, I love when that happened. And then of course a roadrunner ran into the classroom and ran back out. It was, it was, it was great. Um, anyway, so as Melanie stated, we also have this uh, amazing um, greenhouse. And um, unfortunately uh, it's, it's, it's largely empty for a lot of the year, which is just a crime. Um, we don't have a botany class yet. I'm actually working on that for APS for next year, but we can talk about that later. Um, so uh, we have like a garden club and they use some of it. Um, some of our special education programs grow some flowers and that's great for some of those kids because they learn how to you know, take care of something. Um, and then I kind of use it for my little side projects a lot. I, you know, if I get some seeds of something here and there, I'll try to grow them and, or I have some of my students and we work for growing things and, and to plant into the pond at some point. However, um, I really like, um, I've always tried to, to um, as much as I can to get uh, environmental professionals to either come talk to my students or even better take them out in the field um, for the same reason we have the pond for them to realize that these concepts are not just something in a book that they have to learn to pass a test or something but there's actual human beings interesting human beings that you know uh, are more than willing to share this that they have a job um, they get paid for it maybe not much but they get paid 
but they have a passion. And you know, how amazing is it these, these days to, to have a job you get paid for and you're passionate about. And so I try to bring these people in, the ones that I know as much as possible. So I've gotten it's very fortunate to reconnect with Melanie. And like she said, we, we've been working together for, for, for many years, well, five, six years now. Um, so one of the big projects we got, um, Melanie got funding for is um, take advantage of our ginormous greenhouse that was largely empty. And um, working with them, uh, we gathered, you can see this picture here. I believe this is the year before, but we took a field trip. This is my um, AP environmental studies students. So they're, um, I, I mostly teach biology, which is freshmen, which is great. But what's great about these kids is they're juniors and seniors. And so normally it's a smaller class. And because they're older, we have a bit more um, like leniency with uh, as far as APS protocol goes with taking field trips and whatnot, because they can drive. There's a couple forms they have to fill out, but rather than having to raise money for a bus and, and, and you know, permission slips and that what we'd have to do with the younger kids, they can honestly just kind of drive themselves or drive each other. And that makes it really, really um, conducive to doing this kind of stuff. So I think what we're doing here is we're at the, um, the trailhead at the end of Copper. Um, I don't think, is that in Budo? No, I don't think that's in Budo. Um, but anyway, we're there collecting some seeds. I think this was for actually from some different species for another project, but it was great. It got them to literally go out in the field. We were collecting, uh, I think three or four species. So we went over uh, the protocol, how to collect seeds responsibly. You know, we didn't, you know, denude any individual plants or sections, you know, or large areas. We got, I think something 10, 20% available seeds in any given plant. And it was great to get them out in the field. You know, for a lot of the kids, it was maybe their first, second third time they've ever been in the sandias so it was you know it was a beautiful day um forgot to mention prior to that i think we had um, melanie and some of the staff from the um institute um i believe victoria was one of them um came in and gave uh kids workshops on say um seed preparation uh seed cleaning um stratification those were all separate days we had where the kids were doing it hands-on um that was really neat um melanie actually donated a um a very cool um, kind of steampunk uh, seed cleaner that her father had built for her. So, cause they got a, a, a nice new one. So I got the, I got this very cool one from her. I'm very happy to have that. So we can, I have that in my classroom center stage. Uh, but anyway, we're collecting seeds for this trip. Um, and as you can see, we got a lot of seeds, right? So that was the, um, that was the field portion of it um, or the first field portion of it, I should say. Um, we going to the next slide. <coughs> Okay, so there we are in our greenhouse. And so this is after, again, a couple of workshops where we talked about the protocols for stratification and labeling and then the cleaning procedures and whatnot. So I believe we had, I may be wrong on this, Melanie, I think we had a good three days where we did this. I mean, 5,000 plants is a lot of plants. So we had, as you can see, a part of the grant, we bought some of these, um, these container ones from, I believe, Stewie and Sons, if you guys are familiar with them. Um, I had a bunch. Um, I used to have a native plant nursery I ran on during the summers, um, God, like eight years ago. So I had many, many, many left over, but they were dirty. So we had the kids in stations. They were cleaning some. Some were preparing soil. Um, you can see these kids here are actually planting the seeds in there. Um, I think we had three species this time around. Um, I, I think that's the next slide, right? We talk about the three species. Bada bing. There we go. All right. So we had... Um, I'm not, I'm not going to butcher the Latin. I always mispronounce the Latin name. So rather than embarrass myself, I'll stick with the common names. So we had uh, Kota, which by the way, side note, Melanie, uh, <laughs> this is a couple of years ago, we did this project. Um, I reused a lot of that soil that we used for these for some that died or something that we didn't take. So I took, them, I took the soil out, mixed it back up and now I've used it for some of my other projects. I have some, uh, for example, I have some wax currants growing and some screw bean mesquite. Every single one of my pots, I have Kota growing. <laughs> so those seeds are very, very hardy. I have Kota coming out of my ears right now, which is great because obviously I'll just transplant the pond. It's a wonderful plant. So anyway, we grew Kota. Uh, we grew one species of milkweed, the showy milkweed, and uh, white prairie clover. And um, I believe there were roughly equal numbers of each, uh, at least, what, 1,500 or so of each one of them. It was a, it was a lot of plants. Um, and uh, so... After we planted them, you know, we took, you know, the kids kind of took current turns, you know, watering them, monitoring them. Um, we actually did uh, receive funding because right about that time, it was summer vacation, right? And the kids obviously go home. So we got money to um, uh, pay one of my students who lived nearby 
to come by about three times a week. We gave her a key to the greenhouse and she went and took care of them during the summer and she kept a journal of it and everything. So that was really great. Um, I believe this, I'm, forgive me if my timeline is off. I think this must have been the next year in the fall, right? We went and we went down to, I'm sorry? 2019 sorry? in the fall. Okay, okay. And this was, I don't know the name of this place. I know it was in the South Valley. I think it belongs to the city open space. Is that right? It's the Grow the Growers um, oh. farm. Right there in front of me. Thank you. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah, it's in the South Valley. Yeah. So we went to, to, to plant them out. And I believe the rationale was because, you know, they can only get so big and stay healthy in these containers. So we plant them out to allow them to get to a larger size. So they had a better chance when they were going to their final destination of, of surviving. Um, but again, these are older students, so we all just drove down there. The kids drove on their own or they carpooled. We met with um, Melanie and a lot of volunteers from, from all over, which again, to me, is the best part of it, to get the kids to get this one-on-one -on -one time with a lot of these um, you know, older folks who are more than willing and, and ecstatic to kind of pass on their knowledge and their passion to these kids. And so we spent a good afternoon. The kids were just, you know, got dirty, got their hands dirty, got sat down in the turret and planted these plants. Um, I think there's one more pitch or one more slide. There we go. Yeah. So that's one of my favorite pictures. Uh, Zoe. I love that girl. So Zoe's sitting there with, um, I don't know who she's sitting next to, but they were next to each other for like a couple hours and they were just talking and it was, it was very sweet. <laughs> so anyway, um, that was the last that we saw of them. Um, obviously those plants, that was not the end of their journey, but that was the end for my students. Um, and since then, you know, Melanie and I kept in contact. I believe we do have another project in the works for next year. Obviously, COVID threw a monkey wrench into everything, unfortunately. But now that the world is returning somewhat to normalcy, um, I hope we can do projects like this into, into the future. You know, it, the more, the better. But I, I would, you know, my, I got lots of good feedback from the kids. Um, that girl, for example, I believe is going to school in Wisconsin for environmental studies um which is awesome you know so i know not all of them are going to go into that but a large portion of them and you know if i can take five percent credit for stirring them on the right path like that i that, that's amazing to me you know so um very grateful to work with uh with melanie and the institute um so um yeah <laughs> thanks jason and it's a real win-win uh, because Look at all that help we get, um, enthusiastic help mm -hmm. with young backs. <laughs> um, and just to, <laughs> Jason uh, mentioned some of the ways that we spent the Native Plant Society funds, but here's the list. Um, he mentioned the intern that we hired to take care of those plants during the summer. Uh, we used Native Plant Society funds for that, as well as purchasing supplies for taking care of plants and cleaning pots, so important to clean your pots, um, and buying containers. Um, the, you see these um, containers are just these long cylindrical pots you see in the picture on the left. And then um, it also helped us put on those horticultural workshops. Uh, that's all I got, Maria. Okay, thanks Jason and Melanie. Um, I am happy to introduce Paul Ross. Paul has been farming for three years and his work with native plants draws from that experience in farming and a master's degree in landscape architecture from UNM. His interest lies in the intersection of agriculture and conservation ecology, which has been shaped by his experiences with seed farmer Ron Boyd and Borderlands Restoration Network in Southern Arizona. Paul was one of the recipients of the Native Plant Society New Mexico capacity building funds for new native seed farmers in the Albuquerque area. And so Paul will be talking about his experiences growing unique annual native species using different techniques. Take it away, Paul. Great, thank you so much, Maria. And um, for everyone here who's here to hear about these really cool projects, I'm super humbled to be part of this panel um, Jason and Sarah's work is both incredibly inspiring, and I am just blown away at how well they integrate their work with plants into education and social justice and things like that, um, and I'm excited to discuss that further. In terms of my project, um, I 
Well, it started with an office visit that our landscape architecture cohort did to um, IAE's seed lab in Santa Fe. And um, after graduating there, I was kind of juggling a few different projects and approached um, Maria and Melanie about potentially growing some seed for them. And it was a little, it was kind of mid or late May, kind of late to start negotiating um, planting. And we, we just kind of went for it and found, um, decided to do a small research um, kind of experimental field on about a third of an acre total so that I could, um, it wasn't too big. We weren't risking too much seed that they worked so hard to procure and take care of. Um, it's really valuable. And so um, we decided to work with four different species, um, three that we would seed in the field, and then one that we were gonna plant, transplant from, um, from the Santa Ana nursery. Um, so we worked with Verbicina and Saloides or Calpin Daisy, um, horsetail milkweed, and then red whisker clammy weed. The milkweeds were what we transplanted from um, the nursery in Santa Ana. Um, and we decided to do a really simple comparison between direct sowing and um, plug transplanting for both the cowpen daisy and the clammy weed. Um, so this is the a, a diagram of this, this layout of the field that we put together. Um, the species are color coded and then the lines indicate whether they are um, planted as plugs or direct sow. Um, we wanted to, to organize it as much as spe in species, single species blocks as possible so we wouldn't get things confused. Um, and there would be minimal variation between planting conditions of um, a single species. Um, and so we kind of, and we also did a, a slight difference in our application of, of weed suppression fabric, um, which was the main thing that we used the Native Plant Society funds for, was purchasing about half of that fabric. Um, we used two kinds and learned a lot about why it's really important to use black weed fabric, which is um, what we, what Native Plant Society um, helped us with. So we used in the bottom right picture here, you can see that there's, we, we burned holes in the weed fabric and we used two different kind of geometries for that. Um, the, the more circular holes that you can see a little bit further in the distance on that, um, on that lower right hand photograph are for plugs and they're, they were spaced at one foot apart um, and three rows across a six foot, um, a six foot weed, weed fabric strip. And then closer to the camera, you can see we burned um, 18 to 20 inch strips um, on the same lateral spacing um, so that we could seed um, kind of as a, as a seed by hand, um, sprinkling through the weed fabric um, and then thin later to get the desired density similar to the plug plantings that you see in the distance. So um, you can see some seedlings of verbicina popping up on the left. And then um, a lot us, um, a few of us planting um, on the top right that um, I want to quickly mention that we had a lot of help, um, both from a few volunteers that I was able to organize coming out, but predominantly a lot of the manual labor that helped me in this were uh, members of the seed crews that Maria and Melanie run during the summertime, as well as an intern that I had that summer. And so the flexibility that they were able to deploy to help with the big labor days really helped with the success of this project. Um, so moving down into the, into the season, um, you can see on the right-hand side is our other kind of weed fabric. And we use that mostly for the clammy weed. Um, it was helpful for reducing the, the, the weed seed that came in from the flood water, um, but it wasn't as, it was more translucent than the black fabric. And so it didn't solarize um, the soil as well. And it allowed for weed growth underneath the fabric in between the holes. Um, so it became challenging to keep, to, to manage the weeds. We were able to do a pretty good job um, 
but it was it was more labor and I was kind of ended up being a little bit of a manual labor martyr, which was one of my learning points from this whole thing um, um, in terms of in terms of equipment choice. So um, you can see some some young transplant clammy weeds in the bottom right and then the verbicina after it's been thinned on the left. Um, it doesn't look that thin, but it was really happy. Um, I think uh, another thing I'd like to mention is that the field that this was planted in had relatively heavy clay soil. Um, and what that allowed us to do, it was irrigated all on flood irrigation. And what that allowed us to do was to germinate all the seeds that we did direct sow just with the flood. We planted the morning after a flood um, in both species that we worked with. And um, the soil was able to hold its moisture long enough to germinate all those seeds. So in, it was an effective technique in this specific set, setting. I think a well-drained soil would, could have different results um, and different species would also likely have different results, but it was really good feedback um, to see the germination on all of these. Um, and then moving further into the season, um, we got lots of blooms and lots of seed. Um, so here's mostly you see the cowpen daisy. It was definitely the showiest and most fun of the species that we worked with. Um, I had a lot of help again from IE collecting seed at the end of the season once it was um, once kind of frost started to nip things. Um, and um, we harvested a lot of seed. I still don't know exactly how much, but we had um, it, you, you know, the I'm sure there's like all these photos of people stocking up on on toilet paper and groceries at the beginning of the pandemic about a year ago. Um, and we had if if you had seen the number of grocery bags that we had full of seed, it would have looked exactly like that. That's what we were doing. Um, so and I'm still finding these verbicina seeds in my clothes, in my bedding. They just like have infiltrated everywhere. Um, so hopefully they, the ones that made it through the cleaning process and haven't wandered off into the world already will have um, a successful career as they move into their restoration work um, once they go back to the BLM. Um, the, the clammy weed was also um, a success, although not quite as um, ecstatically as the verbicina was. Um, and I think that a lot of that had to do um, with the, the appropriate use of technology in the weed cloth that we were, we were working with, um, which we still have. Um, so um, overall, I think we learned a good bit about um, germinating things straight from seed. A lot of the, the, the plants that you see here that are above head high, um, are the seed started ones and not the um, not the transplanted ones. The transplanted ones did well, but not nearly as well as the ones that were direct sown in the case of verbicina. And then in clammy weed, the ones that were transplanted did much, much poorer than the ones that were direct sown. The direct sown um, were, yeah, it, were pretty much the only ones that set seed in the case of clammy weed. So really good information to go forward, both for you know IAE and myself, but also for any other seed farmers that were looking to build the capacity in this region to, um, to be able to grow seed at scale, um, to be able to supply all these projects. Um, I mentioned that um, the, the labor aspect was a learning point, I think, continuing to refine our technology um, to, you know, with simple technology, weed cloth, hand powered cedars, things like that, I think will will really move this kind of work along um, and open it up in terms of access to other established farmers who do other things as well and kind of being able to integrate this kind of work into their work. Um, so that, yeah, those are some learning points. I'm excited to talk about that more maybe during questions. Last thing I'll mention is that the, the milkweeds have been transplanted to a field that is run, um, that, is, that is being leased by a restoration group that I'm, that I'm now working with um, in kind of this next evolution of seed farming. They're called Rio Grande Return. And my coworker Cameron Weber and I are, um, 
are working to create a similar situation at a field in Corrales there. Um, and we have a diverse set of contracts, both through IAE and through some other and our own work um, to, to continue to hone this, this production seed farming in the middle of Rio Grande Valley. Thank you. Thanks so much, Paul. And yes, like Paul mentioned, um, it was not only a really big success in that we learned a lot from the research aspect of the experiment, but then Paul was also able to just harvest so, so much seed that our plant materials technician is actually still working on cleaning a few months later. So um, we were really appreciative of all of Paul's work and um, especially because it did become just a huge amount of, of work in the field. So um, thanks again, Paul. And uh, yes, I just wanted to mention, which Paul mostly already did, that the, that the um, capacity funding from the Native Plant Society went towards the purchasing the weed fabric barrier for not only Paul's field, but also the um, Grow the Growers field, which you actually saw in, in Jason's slides. And so that went to those two fields. And then we actually reused some of the, of the weed fabric from Paul's field in the new field that he mentioned with Rio Grande Return. So it's the gift that keeps on giving. All right, I'll turn it back to you, Melanie. Great, thanks. And last but not least, um, we, I'm excited to introduce Sarah Digby. Um, Sarah started working with us at the Institute for Applied Ecology in 2017. Um, interestingly, she started as the outreach coordinator for the Native Plant Society of New Mexico. So thank you, Native Plant Society, for bringing Sarah to us. Um, and with her education and background in agriculture, herbalism, botany, outreach, and graphic design, uh, we decided that she was a natural fit to lead our Southwest education program. Um, she helped to create and lead uh, Forest Bound, it's an outdoor program for youth, and she leads our New Mexico Nature and Prisons Project. Sarah has a big heart for plants and the people that she works with, and she has deep wells of energy uh, for um, and creativity when she is teaching. Currently, Sarah spends most of her work time managing operations at a local um, herbal company called Artemisia Herbs, um, however, we're lucky to have her continued support at IAE. Sarah. Thanks, Mom. Uh, so, um, my part today is going to be talking about um, the funds that we received from the Native Plant Society uh, in regards to New Mexico Nature and Prisons, and also a little bit about um, just the general programming that we are doing at the prison. Uh, so we did start in 2018. Ella Samuel was the lead for the prison project at that point, and she, uh, along with Melanie and IAE, began to develop um, sort of a curriculum for uh, horticulture, agriculture practices, um, particularly as they pertain to native plant production, and um, were able to establish a couple green, or I believe one greenhouse at that time, um, for native seed production, growing out uh, various species for not only restoration, but using in fields for seed production as well. Then in 2019, we were able to continue the program and a really exciting part of that program was we were able to take one of the previous participants who worked with us and actually engage him in a leadership role with uh, what we were doing and to actually co-educate and co-lead the program with, um, with myself at that time. And so that was really great. He did an excellent job. Um, and so he also was a crucial component to kind of what we were doing because he was great at engaging uh, the participants. You know, when we weren't able to be there working with them, he was working with them in capacity of helping lead the book sessions, which I'll talk about a little bit later, and just really engaging with them um, with the material and um, uh, the information outside of having someone from IAE there. So I think that's been a great opportunity for 
someone to be able to participate who's been in the program and also just really helpful for us to have someone who is advocating for the program and excited to teach others who's actually within the prison itself. So 2019, we had 24 participants. Um, excuse the dog, she's whining right now. Um, and uh, then we also had Isaac who was a lead for the program. And um, then obviously 2020, we didn't really have anything because of COVID, but we are hoping to reestablish the program again. Um, if not this year, then definitely next year and continue to grow uh, more plants and expand the educational program and hopefully be able to continue to have that supportive role from someone with inside the prison as well. Um, another really fun component to, um, sorry, to the program is we are able to bring in guest speakers to come and work with us as well. So we um, have had a number of workshops as well as guest speakers come in and talk to us about their different line of work, uh, what they're doing in the community, and also different avenues for folks um, who will be getting out to be able to um, apply for jobs within the community as well. So they're getting a well-rounded experience of not only learning um, horticultural practices, agricultural practices, um, but are also able to kind of look at different green careers that are available to them once they get out. And um, also how to physically grow plants because we're actually hands on working to grow these plants and um, have them go out back into the community as well. Um, at the end of the program, they also do receive a certificate of completion. So they're able to show that to uh, an employer or um, you know, just have that in their back pocket for when they're able to kind of go back out into the world. Uh, and that actually has proved to be pretty important to them. So it's a great component to the program as well. So a really wonderful support to us has been um, Del Jimenez. And so he actually has been the one who's been able to spearhead the hoop house um, construction as well as the shade structure uh, construction. And he is just a wealth of knowledge. He works for NMSU Ag Extension and he is just a wonderful person and has been able to, he basically just volunteers his time because he's an advocate for the program and just wants to see it succeed. And he, uh, so he was kind of the lead on building that hoop house and then as well for that shade structure, which is what we received funding for in 2019. Next slide. So there's a really crude drawing of the shade structure. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to get a photo of it um, just because of kind of restrictions at the prison, but I tried to just draw something up that gave you a little bit of an idea of what it was. So it's, a, it's actually pretty heavy duty. So we were able to get some really strong steel rods that we then dug holes and poured concrete into and were able to kind of really get them in the ground. And all of this was done um, with Dell, but also um, by the participants. So the participants were super involved um, in putting this whole thing together. They were the ones digging the holes, pouring concrete, putting the steel posts in. And then up top, we had some heavy duty shade cloth that we put on with different levers. And so what's nice about that is it's able to come down at the winter or during the windy times in the spring um, so that it doesn't get damaged. And so it's a Dell created this cool little pulley system where you can kind of pull it up like a flag almost, have it uh, taut with the steel rods, and then it's going to be providing shade for the plants that we're um, then hardening off to be planted. And also a really cool um, aspect of it is that it provides some shade for us while we're doing workshops as well because it gets pretty hot out there and kind of intense with the sun. We're super exposed um, on the side of the prison. And so there is a little bit of shade. Uh, there is a structure that we can go into, but this is actually right next to the hoop house, which is great. So we're able to work in that area, have the plants in that area, go back and forth from the greenhouse and it's just really accessible. So it's been um, a great, great help to us. Um, and we're really appreciative of the funds to be able to build this and to also give the experience to the participants to be able to kind of like learn how to build something like this and understand it a little bit better. Next slide. 
so another component that we integrated in 2019 um, is actually we created a book club, which surprisingly went over really well. Um, I thought it would be interesting to add this element in and give them give the participants a little bit more um, to do while they were not in the program. And because um, they just were hungry for knowledge and just wanted as much information and as much material as they could get. So we were able to purchase, I think it was like um, uh, nine or 10 of these books, I believe in the end, but um, and then give them to the participants while they're in the program to read. And so they basically had uh, a chapter every two weeks that they read and then Isaac would lead um, sort of these summary sessions with them so they could go back over, ask questions, um, it, discuss what was in the book, discuss what the, they learned. And then at the end of the program, we were able to kind of discuss the book as a whole. And so this went over really well. People enjoyed it and they felt like they learned a lot and um, hopefully it'll be able to be something that we continue in the coming years as well. Next slide. So as far as the seed sowing uh, component to the program, we try to do about 5,000 native plants a year uh, with three different species of plants that we grow out. And so in 2019, we did ripe per white prairie coneflower, um, showy milkweed, and then kota, I believe. And so all of these, um, many of the seeds were donated from folks. We did have some starts donated as well. Um, a lot of them were also from collections. So they kind of um, came from a few different places and then folks grew them out. And we weren't able to do an outplanting in 2019, unfortunately. Um, we do try to get the participants to be able to go off site and do a planting um, at different restoration sites. Uh, but we ran into a couple snags, but that is another aspect to the program that the participants um, hopefully get to engage with the community and do a community planting as well with those plants. Um, and then, um, oh yeah, so, so they weren't able to do that this last year, but we were able to do some plantings on the grounds themselves. So if you can go to the next slide. So this was a cool project. Um, because we weren't able to actually go outside the prison walls, um, we decided to take some of these extra plants that were currently in use or were uh, left over from 2018 uh, to use to kind of beautify the prison or provide an educational component to the grounds on the prison. And so we did a number of different species. We did some roses, we did some of the cone flowers, we did a Mexican hat, we did some of the milkweed, I believe as well. Uh, some of the kota, and there was three different sites that we planted. Um, so there was the administration build them, building and then a couple of the different levels at the print at the prison. And we basically planted kind of in the front area, um, as well as one of the um, different gardens that they had on the grounds. And so this was just an exercise in letting the participants kind of plan and uh, take lead of how they wanted to do it. We split them into three groups. Each participant was able to create a little educational card. They drew the plants, um, then they kind of wrote down the natural habitat, how they grow, what kind of watering they like so that hopefully people can continue to care for them until they're established. And then the three groups went to each of the three locations and planted those on the grounds. And they really loved it. They thought it was a great opportunity. And then they also established relationships with other um, folks in the different levels to help maintain and take care of those plants as well. So kind of spread, the word spread for sure about the program and got people excited about it. Next slide. And then the last component, so my background, obviously, um, I have an herbal background and I really enjoy teaching that. And so we do a lot of workshops with ethnobotany. The first year that I was there, we were able to do an actual hands-on component where we created salve and made a tea and then had like a taste test for all the different products that Artemisia makes, uh, similar to some of the workshops that I've done with Native Plant Society as well. And so they're able to kind of talk about their relationship to the plants, um, any sort of uses that they've used for them before. Uh, then also talking about traditional use and Western uses um, from my own personal knowledge. 
and then they get to just have a different experience and relationships with those plants besides um, growing them. They're actually kind of, you know, obviously learning about the food aspect and the medicine aspect of the plants as well. So they're gaining more relationships through touching them, tasting them, smelling them, and um, getting to know them in a different way. Next slide. So yeah, so the $1,500 that we received went directly towards the material costs for creating the shade structure, as well as um, the mileage for Dell's um, travel expenses. And so we were able to put that up and um, I'm sure it's still there and thriving. And that's what I got. So much, Sarah. And yeah, thanks to all our panelists for sharing all of the work that you have been doing. It's really exciting. And so I know there's already some questions for them, which is great, but just quickly, I wanted to wrap up by sharing a little bit more about where some of these plant materials ended up going after their nursery and, and seed production phases. And so on this slide here, you can see a milkweed community planting day at the Taos BLM um, Wild Rivers Recreation Area. And so these milkweeds that were grown at the Nature and Prisons Project were planted as part of this um, pollinator and native plant demonstration garden at, for visitors to learn about their importance for monarchs along the Rio Grande there. And then other plants that were born that were grown both at the prison and at Cindia High School, like you saw, were, were outplanted to the Grow the Growers um, training program field in the South Valley of Albuquerque. And that's the same farm that a portion of the weed fabric went to. And those plants are still in production and we've been harvesting seed from them for the last two years. And that seed will go to an even bigger increase field for the New Mexico Bureau of Land Management. And the seed that's been harvested from Paul's production field is like I said, currently being processed, but um, it was exciting because there was so much seed that we were actually able to use um, it in multiple ways. And so a portion of that harvest is actually being used as the source seed for another seed farm that Paul mentioned in Corrales. And we're actually going to be seeding that, that field next week. And then some other seed from Paul's harvest are going to be used in a USGS um, oil well restoration research project in the Farmington BLM district. And so we are just really grateful for these type of capacity building funds like those provided by the Native Plant Society because they really strengthen the Southwest Sea Partnership and are really important for our success. Um, I think in order to build the sort of native, sustainable native seed industry that we envision, um, we need to be able to provide support to nurseries and farmers so that they, they have the resources that they need in order to be successful. And transitioning to this type of nursery cultivation or field production um, of native species can be difficult and risky and infrastructure funds are, are often pretty hard to secure. And so we hope to engage more people in the native plant um, materials development process in the future. Um, and we hope to be able to increase capacity for native plant nurseries, seed farmers, and, and just the partnership as a whole. So I think uh, I'll leave it at there. And Melanie, um, would you like to start with the Q&A? Sure, yeah, such interesting projects. And um, thank you again, panelists. Um, so now's uh, the time where uh, you get to um, ask questions of the panelists. And again, you can use either the chat uh, um, uh, to ask your question or raise your hand. And um, I saw that Gary and Penny Ho um, had a question earlier. Um, if you would like to go ahead and ask that question to the group since your hand was raised, and I see it's also in the chat here, but um, would you like to start, Gary and Penny? Are they still here? <laughs> How about I read the question? Um, the question is, Clammy weed seed capsules are spring loaded and open at a touch, throwing seeds everywhere. What was your harvest mechanism? And I believe that question was for Paul. Paul did yeah. answer it, I think, pretty good. He, he did have a thing down there. I wish I had seen how that worked, but it worked pretty good, I believe. Uh, 
I, yeah. I, I can read the answer down there. He harvested mainly by hand, but because of the spring loaded capsules, it spilled a bunch of seeds on the ground, but that's on top of the weed fabric. So they were able to vacuum them up with a little hand vacuum. And uh, that helps an awful lot. I'm glad to see that that was done. Uh, we've tried to harvest some too, just walking around in our neighborhood past the Arroyo and it's very Dickens. They fly everywhere. Yeah, ab absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, something I'll just mention too in connection with this is that there were probably a lot of escaped seeds, um, both in the clammy weed and in the verbis. We know there was a lot of escaped seeds in the verbicina. So that field is not in flood production this year because of water constrictions. So um, I'm really interested to informally go out there and, and, and look at it maybe soon and then also during the rainy season and see what comes up um, and whether that would, um, yeah, see if those native plants really outcompete some of the other things that are, that are still in, in the seed bank out there. Thanks. Yeah, and then a few comments here. Pam McBride says, Frenchie's Field in Santa Fe used to be a mass of verbicina. Yes, I've seen that, Pam. Um, not sure if it's still the case, but you could certainly harvest a lot of seeds there. We might have. What, did we harvest seeds from there, Maria? Uh, at least the last two years, there's a little corner over by the shed that's still full of verbicina, but the field, most of the field itself is not at least the last two years has been mostly kochia and tumbleweed unfortunately so maybe it'll come back but um that would be a much better much better scene than what i've seen the last two years right and i'm not seeing any other hands raised so i'll just go ahead and go to the next question in the chat um are you going to grow other asclepias besides um well we root um Asclepius speciosa in this project, but the question is, are you going to grow other Asclepius besides Subverticillata for restoration? Um, Maria, would you like to take that question? Sure, yeah. Yeah, Speciosa and Subverticillata are often on our partner's um, target species list, but I think that there is an interest in some of the other species as well, although they might not be quite as easy to, to wild collect. But I think generally there's a lot of interest in in all Asclepius for sure. All right, well, um, we have a few questions for the panel. Um, if there aren't any questions coming to mind right away, but keep the questions coming in the chat. Um, and I will go ahead and ask one of our questions um, to each of the panelists. Um, what do you feel was your greatest accomplishment? And I'll start with Paul since he was just talking. Sure. Um, I think there, um, there were a lot of things that felt like a couple big things that felt like big successes with this project. Um, I think the two we've, the two of which we've touched on, um, procure just growing a large volume of seed that is going to immediately go to, to good use, I think is one of them. Um, and then also contributing to uh, just like, you know, piece by piece, a little bit more to the knowledge base of how to do this kind of work. Um, moving into the future. Um, I just want to underline those two things. And then maybe quickly also say that, um, you know, there, the, the field was, was kind of funky. It was hard to irrigate. I was there late at night a lot of the time. And it was really fun. Um, it was really incredible to feel connected to a process that was bigger than myself. Um, and I think that's why I'm drawn to this work and likely a component of why all of us are in, in this society and, and in this work as well. So um, I just wanted to throw that out there that um, connection to processes that feel um, growing and, and larger than just us is, I think is an accomplishment too. That's lovely. Thank you, Paul. Um, Sarah, would you like to respond to that question about what you feel like your greatest accomplishment was with this project? Yeah. Um... I think that, I mean, just the accomplishment in general from the program is just being able to be in the prison and working with folks. And I don't really take credit for that at all. So I think it's just a general, a general accomplishment that I feel really excited to be a part of and excited to continue to be a part of as much as I can. Um, I think that it's 
been a really beneficial program for folks. And um, I think people have really enjoyed it and really learned a lot. And um, I just, you know, I think it's great to see those opportunities in, you know, a system that's pretty rough for people and doesn't necessarily offer a lot of solutions when they get outside. Um, so I think a great accomplishment is just being able to provide these folks with some skills to be able to kind of get back into the world um, with a technical opportunity to grow plants and be reestablished with nature and have that connection. Um, and then hopefully, you know, we are working on an opportunity as well for possibly providing an, um, a position for people to work with IAE eventually who have done the program. So if we can get that going, I will say that will be an accomplishment for sure. So yeah. kind of how I feel about it. Nice, thanks. Um, there are some questions uh, coming up here, um, but uh, I'd like to give Jason a chance to respond to that question and we'll get to the ones in the chat. Okay, yeah, um, I don't know where to start. Um, I think as far from the student's perspective, again, um, what I mentioned is I think the opportunity for them to get to uh, meet professionals in environmental fields of all sorts, um, to me, I think was the most valuable um, to just to make those connections, to get to see this. It's a real world thing. Real people are passionate and interested about this. And this is not just something they read about or maybe see on TV, but it's a, it's an actual career path that they could uh, hopefully follow, spark that interest. Um, I think any chance to get the kids outside, especially these days of all days, is you can't overstress how important that is. I mean, nature, nature deficit disorder is is thriving these days, sadly. So to get them outside is, is is amazing. I think the process of growing plants, I would say for teenagers, I would say especially these days is very important in the world of instant gratification on their phones. I mean, you can't speed it up. You know, the plant's going to grow as fast as it's going to grow. And for them to kind of um, stick with it um, in order to see, you know, all this hard work and planting these, you know, putting these little seeds in the, in the dirt and that's it. And then to see weeks go by and weeks go by and then they sprout and then they grow and then they get to plant them out. I think uh, for them to go kind of like full term with that, uh, I think for teenagers was a hopefully a really valuable lesson for them. Um, and then for me too, I, you know, I have a field biology background. So as much as I, I love teaching, but it's always nice for me to, to get back out in the field and kind of, you know, um, you know, get my hands dirty, literally. So yeah, um, again, I hope we're doing this for years to come. Great. Um, Maria, I, thank you, Jason. Uh, Maria, I think we can um, take down the slideshow so we can see more people's uh, faces on the screen. Um, and yeah, so we've got a question here from uh, Sarah, Sarah Keeney. Can farmers make money growing native seed? Um, and I'm wondering if there's anyone from the panel that would like to answer that, or Maria, perhaps. Um, I'm happy to answer. Um, sort of a qualified yes. Um, the way that we work with farmers at IAE is we use funds from our partners mostly federal land management agencies to contract with, with farmers like Paul um, to grow our native seed fields. And so it's on sort of a um, cost per acre per year basis. Um, so we are able to provide some funding, but it's not really meant to be a long-term sustainable model in that respect. The hope is that eventually they would be able to sell that seed um, on speculation on sort of the open market. However, I, that is still, you know, for, for brand new farmers that would, that would take a while to get that established. And there are sort of large native seed producers across the West that, that are able to, you know, make a whole business out of it. Um, but they do also rely on some non-native species and some, and some native species that are cultivars. So they're, they're not as, as tricky to grow and, and diverse as the seeds that we're working with. Um, that's the short answer there. Yeah, and, and a lot of it de depends on um, them knowing that there's going to be a demand for the seeds that they're growing so that it's worth their while. Um, and let's, if nobody buys the seeds, um, they're not gonna make the money. Um, 
how can interested people volunteer to help plant or collect seed for planting? Um, we do events here at IAE. Um, in fact, we just um, had an event recently, although that was a weeding event, <laughs> but that we do have um, volunteer events for seed collecting and uh, planting. And um, I can um, share uh, our web address that you can uh, sign up for to be a volunteer if you would like to do that. Um, here's a question from Carol to, um, it looks like uh, to Jason. Did the students enjoy the experience of growing and planting and want others to be involved in this in the future? Um, want others as far as um, students in the future, is that what that means? Um, like, like future students at school to be involved in it? Um, I would say, yeah. Um, the thing with the students is, especially with the older ones, is that we have this, I have this one year with them um, and, you know, then little baby birds get to take off and scatter throughout the country. Um, I do, you know, I'm lucky enough, you know, with social media being what it is, and I, I, I never reach out to the students, but if they, you know, when they graduate, some of them, you know, a few, not many, but some of them keep in, you know, choose to keep in touch with me, which I'm very flattered by and everything. And, and the feedback I hear from them is largely very positive about the experiences they've had with this um, and getting to meet, you know, Melanie and all these other folks. Um, I can say this, I've never heard them complain about it. <laughs> so I know when there's a day coming up where they get to plan, uh, um, I don't have a lot of kids ditching or something that day. The attendance <laughs> is pretty good and, and they get to get outside and, you know, kids are kids. So, you know, it's hot. Some of them don't like getting dirty, but they usually get over that pretty quick. Um, so, yeah, I would definitely say they enjoy it. Great. Thank you. Um, here's another question um, from Sarah. Does Paul take volunteer interns in Albuquerque? Or Santa Fe. I don't know that you work in Santa Fe, Paul, but um, they're asking about uh, if you accept volunteers to help you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm. I'm most. I'm based in Albuquerque, and most of our work this year is going to be at the field we've talked about in Corrales. Um, but we are always happy to coordinate help. Um, I can put. Um, we can, if it's okay with everyone, I can put phone number and email in, in the chat. And if anyone's interested, we can figure something out. Um, my, my colleague, Cameron Weber is, is also an incredible resource for all these kinds of things. And um, we would both be really excited to continue to grow our community um, around making this work happen. Thanks. Um, here's a question for Sarah. Uh, from Gary and Penny, what was the final deposition of the plants grown at the prison um, since they were uh, flowers and not food? Um, so could not be used within the prison, but hopefully used, had a market outside. Um, I guess I'm not really sure how to answer that question. Or is it that like where did they go or? Um... I think, yeah, I think that that's the, that's the question um, because you know, there's a lot of programs for like growing your own food in um, at the penitentiary and then eat, eating that food and it all staying internal. And so did any, did any of the plants go out is the question. Okay, yeah, so, so most of the plants did go out. We did have, you know, that planting that we were able to put um, around the three sites at the prison, which was about 30 or 40 plants in total. The rest of the plants did actually go out to, um, I think we did them to grow the growers and then a couple other restoration sites as well. And I think Melanie, you could maybe touch a little bit more on that. Yeah, I think Maria, um, would probably be better to talk about that. Yeah, the um, all the milkweed was was planted, and it was planted either at the at the Taos Wild River site that I that I showed on the last slide, um, and also along the Rio Grande or Rio Verde Park. Great. Um, here's a question. Um, can I think it's for you, Maria? Um, can you talk about the shortage of seeds for restoration after fire or other destruction importance in addressing climate change? 
Yeah, so the first part of that question, yeah, there's still sort of uh, different, you know, the supply and the demand isn't always um, matching for, for native seeds. And so we've seen historically after a really large fire year in the West that there isn't enough native seed to reseed those areas um, in order to, to control erosion after fire. And so every year, including now, um, federal agencies have to buy non-native species to, to use for their um, rehabilitation purposes. And that's because it's really hard to um, predict those fires. They're, you know, it's not the same as sort of other restoration projects where you can say, okay, in five years, I'm gonna need this much seed. Um, and so that's still something that the that the market is, you know, addressing. And really what we're trying to do is advocate for for an in increased supply so that it's consistent when when those sort of large needs happen. And that's really still about, you know, increasing the demand and making sure that folks know that the demand is there no matter if it's a fire or if there's just other needs for seeds. Um, and then, yeah, the importance in address addressing climate change. So really we're, we're thinking about climate change here in the Southwest when we're thinking about seeds, that seeds should be locally sourced. But there also is a lot of talk about sourcing seed for the future and for a hotter climate. And so some folks think that, you know, sourcing seed from hotter and drier climates um, is, a, is a good idea because those seeds might be um, what's needed in, you know, in a decade, five decades down the road um, in order to, to survive the conditions then. It's definitely a hot topic. No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and I would just add that um, we, when we do our collections, we collect, um, uh, we try to get as much genetic diversity as possible. So we collect from multiple individuals and multiple populations and um, that genetic diversity sort of um, builds that resilience uh, for um, being able to adapt to different conditions. Um, here's a fun question. Um, Jason, what invasive species did you serve as food? Um, I don't remember what our side dish was, but we did bullfrogs. So um, yeah, Melanie and Melanie's husband and some other folks and I uh, had a very fun night going down to Bosque del Apache where we got to um, we got to uh, gig some bullfrogs down there. And there's actually a film on it on YouTube. I think a museum in Santa Fe did a film. <laughs> and, um, yeah, and so um, we, uh, there was, I, I don't remember all the details, not only the name of the restaurant, but there was a restaurant, a gourmet chef cooked them up. If you never had them, really, really good. But I believe there was a plant side dish and I cannot yeah, remember, we talked about a lot. Dandelion. The problem was it was, yeah, dandelion, yeah. crawdads, because crawdads are also invasive. And it was, yeah, it's a French chef. I think it's called 591. It's in Santa Fe and um, it was yeah. delectable. Um, yeah, and we also tried, um, was it salsola? We harvested that, but we got to it too late and it was really woody and it was just too, too we got it too late. <laughs> Don't yeah. wait till the end to harvest your salsola. <laughs> <laughs> and then we wanted to get um, Siberian elm seeds, but they were done by the time we had the event. And mm -hmm. so um, uh, the next question, let's see, Maria, oh, Maria put up a, a link to the Southwest Seed Partnership. And thanks, Pam, for your comment about the great programs. Um, and Paul has his email up here. And here's a question from Carol. Will different native plants be chosen for future plantings? And that's pretty similar to the one that uh, Maria uh, just answered. Um, the, do you feel like um, that question got answered, Carol? You're on mute, Carol. I are. looked at nine or ten different plants primarily that you were growing, and I wondered if, I don't know why those ones were selected, but I wondered if there were other ones you'd be trying in the future. 
There are so many other ones we're, we'll be trying in the future. Yeah, <laughs> we're all about the diversity and there's so many, so many awesome grass and forb and shrub species that we're really interested in. So it's just a matter of having enough seed in order to do a project with and um, and then and then making sure that folks are interested in that in that seed for for a restoration or a research project. How many species do we have and how many acres, Maria, right now? So yeah, right this in 2021, we're working with 16 different species on about nine different acres with six different farmers. And so definitely upping our numbers. But yeah, there's there's definitely more in the future that we'd love to work with. Great. Well, that's all the questions I'm seeing. Um, I don't let me see if I can see any hands. I'm not seeing any hands. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for um, for the great questions and your interest in staying on. <laughs>